Bye Bye Birdie, Camelot, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and The Fiddler on the Roof are just a few of the many productions that debuted in New York City during the 1960s. Hi, I'm Shannon Rice, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN, and this week's Lectures in History podcast showcases the culture of the 1960s, specifically the relationship between Broadway and off-Broadway productions, and how smaller theaters were often more experimental and responded to current issues such as the Vietnam War. Class starts with Baruch College professors Vincent de Girolamo and Elizabeth Woolmean after this. Hello. Welcome to Monday. <laughs> Perfectly typical day in class. Welcome. So as you see, I have prepared a little introduction to our class called Broadway in the 60s, War and Resistance. Um, so over the course of the semester, we've been looking at the evolution of Broadway plays of, musical, of the musical tradition from minstrel shows in antebellum America and post-Civil War era. We were looking at uh, vaudeville and burlesque in the, in the later 19th century, early 20th century, up to the 1940s with the uh, uh, sort of the birth of the integrated musical. And so we've been asking two primary questions, I think, throughout the, the course. How were musicals shaped by their times? by the influx of people, by the, by the political conditions, by new technology, and how have musicals dealt with the major historical issues of their day, be it slavery and racism, uh, women's rights, uh, class conflict, industrialization, uh, the Great Depression, and, um, and uh, um, up to and including war has been a constant in this, in, this, uh, in this story. And so as we come into the 1960s, uh, war is necessarily of central importance. Uh, so what I thought I would do today is to just begin to sketch uh, a timeline of events, uh, political, theatrical, and military, that characterize the period, and then ask you to think about uh, the role of Broadway musicals during this tumultuous decade. Okay? Okay. So let me begin with January 20th, 1961, when John F. Kennedy is sworn in as president. He gives a stirring inaugural address. We discussed the sort of the rise of the youth culture last time as the 60s got underway. Um, and this, this, this youth orientation was not restricted to ordinary people, but, but the president, the White House, and the, this new energy. And so here is John Kennedy with his inauguration saying, the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. The most memorable applause line uh, came toward the end when, when Kennedy said, I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion with, which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So you can imagine hearing this as a young person, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a voter, as someone who who's, uh, finally sees someone from their generation or close to it taking the reins of power. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Kennedy stumbled out of the gate by backing the disastrous uh, Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, on April 17, 1961, and then getting embroiled in Vietnam. Here he is at a press conference in March pointing out uh, the communist threat to, 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 to Laos, uh, uh, just north of, the, of Vietnam. In May, he sends helicopters and 400 Green Berets to South Vietnam and authorizes secret operations against the Viet uh, Cong. Okay, so this is, this is the, 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 the gear up. Where's Broadway? Uh, later that year, the risque uh, comedy, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, uh, starring Robert Morris and Rudy Valley, uh, opens at the 46th Street Theater on Broadway. The show wins seven Tony Awards and the 1962 Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Uh, 
1962, the best musical Tony went to a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, starring Zero Mostel, who had long been blacklisted in Hollywood uh, and elsewhere. Uh, far less successful was Irving Berlin's last musical, Mr. President, uh, which President Kennedy and Jackie attended at a, at a tryout in Washington, D.C. Uh, the production made it to Broadway, but was panned as old-fashioned, despite its topical, light-hearted Cold War plot. Now, notice, if you will, and it's hard not to, the, the awesome physical beauty of this couple. couple right? So the youth movement uh, here is carrying out this 45-year-old Jack Kennedy, the second youngest president elected, and, uh, and Jackie is, is 33. So their energy, their, their spirit is, is uh, contagious. And indeed, um, Kennedy's brief presidency came to be known as Camelot, right? The, myth, the mythical kingdom ruled over by King Arthur, Guinevere, uh, the Knights of the Round Table. So the Camelot nickname uh, had, its root, had its roots in, in Broadway. Of course, Kennedy loved the 1960 musical, the music uh, of which was written by one of his uh, schoolmates at Harvard, Alan J. Lerner. But just as Camelot, as in Camelot, all was not well in the Kennedy administration. Uh, in October 1962, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union stood on the brink of nuclear war uh, when it was discovered that the USSR had installed uh, ballistic missiles in Cuba to prevent another invasion like the Bay of Pigs. Uh, the U.S. set up a blockade to prevent the delivery of any more missiles. And after 12 days of tense negotiations, the Soviet Union agreed to withdraw its missiles uh, if the U.S. would withdraw its missiles in Turkey. So disaster was averted, uh, but not for long. So trouble flares again in Vietnam uh, in August of 64, unsubstantiated uh, reports of an attack on a U.S. vessel in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, spurs Congress to pass the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which authorizes the president to take all necessary measures, including the use of armed forces, against any uh, aggressor in the conflict. So this is the carte blanche. This is what authorizes the president to uh, 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 gear up this war and prosecute it without a formal uh, a declaration by Congress. Um, so uh, I'm a little, I'm a little off. What am I a little off? Yeah. So that's that. Um, and uh, what happens is um, uh, in uh, <clears throat> I had a little. There's there's the the Gulf of uh, Tonkin. This is McNamara talking about the, the attack. Uh, and then as we go, this is the, this is the, 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 the plays that were uh, the hits of, the, of the, the time. And we'll talk more about these. Fiddler on the Roof, Funny Girl, uh, Hello Dolly, and Man of La Mancha. Uh, so in March uh, 1965, President Johnson launches a three-year, well, I, I, I had one slide out of, out of place. So what happens, also we're gearing up in Vietnam. Uh, this is my slide for this. Uh, uh, U.S. supports the assassination of Diem, the ruler in Vietnam, and his brother. And uh, this is uh, November 63. Kennedy himself is assassinated, as we know, in November 1963. And this is the end of Camelot, of course. His vice president, uh, Lyndon Johnson, is, is, is sworn in. And he vows to uh, continue the, the Kennedy agenda by, you know, domestically with his great society of, of, of social reforms. But, of course, the war takes over and gets in his way. Uh, of course, uh, another sort of uh, rather uh, uh, lighthearted comedy is, is, on, is on Broadway. Here's Love, based on the Christmas movie Miracle on 34th Street, about a little girl who, who doubts the existence of Santa Claus. So in some ways it's unfair. I'm sort of juxtaposing these serious political events with these, with these very light, fluffy uh, Broadway. And so you know, one of the questions is, you know, how does Broadway deal with the war? Why should it deal with the war? You know, what, what, what is the role of, of, of entertainment anyway? Uh, but we see the war sort of coming more and more to the attention of uh, Broadway producers. So here is the, uh, uh, what we just covered. Um, and then, so Kenneth, uh, J Johnson is in charge, and he, he gears up, and he starts to uh, uh, 
uh, prosecute the war more diligi- diligently. Uh, March 1965, he launches a three-year campaign of sustained bombing targets in North Vietnam and the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Operation Rolling Thunder. Uh, the same month, U.S. Marines land in Da Nang uh, on the beaches and, and South Vietnam. Uh, 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 and, and, and so the first combat troops are really, are really deployed in, in large numbers there. In November, we have an act of protest, an act of, of uh, dissent, uh, and that is uh, Norman Morrison, a 31-year-old pacifist, a Quaker from Baltimore. He sets himself on fire in front of the Pentagon to protest the war. Uh, the Buddhist monks in Vietnam have been lighting themselves on fire as a way of protest. And so this comes, this comes home. Yes. What's his name? His name is Norman Morrison. Yeah. When it says with baby, does that mean that he set himself on fire with He him? he actually did and people said give us the baby and so they somebody took the baby and, and he and the baby lived. Um, but right. So it's a bizarre act of protest, a very extreme act of protest. Okay, so this is what's happening. Meanwhile on Broadway we have a teenage Eliza Minnelli making her Broadway debut in Flora, the Red Menace, uh, but the show Plummets following a brief run. Uh, the biggest flop of the season, however, is this one, Kelly, inspired by newsboy Steve Brody. Sorry for the newsboy reference. Uh, but in 1886, he, he is said to have jumped off the, the new Brooklyn Bridge, and he becomes a showman, and he launches an uh, axe in, in, in New York. Um, and... Um, and, and it was probably a big ruse that he, that he faked the jump. But anyway, this show closes after one, one night. And so the word Brody sort of enters the vocabulary as a synonym for flop. When a show Brodies, it, it flops. <laughs> um, in 1966, uh, the number of U.S. troops in Vietnam numbers 400,000. Uh, the Broadway hits uh, of, six, of 66 were Cabaret. Uh, Sweet Charity and Angela Lansbury in, in Mame. Um, uh, but a new kind of musical is on the scene. And this is an experimental uh, piece of agitprop created by Megan Terry with input from cast members uh, Jerome Ragney and James Ratto. Now, it's a product of the experimental off, off-Broadway open theater, and it was the first rock musical written and performed in the United States and the first protest play about Vietnam. It premiered at the La Mama Experimental Theater Club uh, on May 8th, 18th, 18th, uh, 1966. Uh, and it was also a milestone in interactive theater in that the, the actors are going out to the audience and interacting with, with them. Okay, so the, the war is coming here in this way. Uh, 67, meanwhile, the number of troops reaches 500,000, half a million. So a quarter of whom were draftees who accounted for about 30% of the casualties. Uh, Young people could get deferments if they were enrolled in college. So the bulk of these draftees were from working class families, including blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans. Um, and, uh, and these numbers are, are disturbingly going up. And as the numbers go up, the protests uh, increase as well. Huge anti-war protests occur in Berkeley, San Francisco, New York, and Washington, Washington, D.C. So now, 1968 proves to be critical to this, to this story. The Tet Offensive uh, begins in January. Tet, of course, is the Vietnamese New Year's. And uh, and they are they are uh, the North Vietnamese are uh, on the on the offensive. So it's a combined assault of Viet Minh and North Vietnamese armies. Attacks are carried out in more than a hundred cities and outposts across South Vietnam, including Hue and Saigon. And the U.S. embassy is invaded. Uh, so this effective bloody attack. Uh, it shocks U.S. Official, officials and marks a real turning point in the war and the beginning of a gradual U.S. withdrawal from the region. Uh, casualties continue to mount, however. A record 543 soldiers were killed during one week in, in February. Um, add to this, uh, 1968, March 16th, we have the My Lai Massacre. Uh, in which more than 500 civilians are murdered by U.S. forces. 
The victims are men, women, and children. This, of course, is not made public for about 20 months later when the reporter, New York reporter Seymour Hersh, uh, un- uncovers the story. And so this war is just disintegrating into, into an indefensible action abroad. Um, President Johnson halts the bombing uh, in Vietnam, uh, north of the 20th parallel, and uh, he's facing a backlash about the war, and he announces uh, that he will not run for re-election. So I, I remember this talk. It was March 31st, 1968. It was my birthday. I was turning 13 years old, and he comes on, on the television, and he said, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination uh, of my party for another term as your president. This was saying, you know, I'm, I have to prosecute the war. I have to, we need peace. I'm, I'm reaching out for peace, but I can't be bothered with campaigning or anything like that. So it was, it was couched in those, in those kinds of uh, service terms. But his whole domestic legacy and, and agenda was sort of being over, overshadowed by Vietnam. So we have My Lai, we have, we have LBJ uh, dropping out, and then we have the assassinations of Martin Luther King in April of 68, uh, he had denounced the war the year, the previous war, talking about the role of African American soldiers and the, the high casualties, followed by Robert Kennedy in Los Angeles the night he won the California primary and basically cinched the, uh, clinched the uh, uh, Democratic nomination by running on an anti war uh, platform. Instead, uh, Richard Nixon is elected president uh, in November. And he said he had a secret plan to end the war. In fact, he sabotages the Paris peace talks, secretly expands the war to Laos and Cambodia, and institutes the first draft lottery since World War II, uh, prompting, prompting even more men to flee to Canada, more young, young men. So these so-called draft dodgers uh, become the subject of a Ragni and Rado's uh, successor to Viet Rock. And this is the play that you'll be uh, talking about, Hair, the American Tribal Love Rock Musical. Uh, so here the war finally comes in a, in a direct way to Broadway. So I just wanted to, to set the table with this chronology and then ask you about things, we could talk about this afterwards, about Broadway's response to this unpopular uh, war and the, and the social crisis. Was it predictable? Was it... Was it, was it ostrich-like uh, uh, or, or not, and, and especially compared to other art forms, whether it's film or, or, or uh, um, music. Music, I think we, we see a, a major response. Uh, the other thing is, what should it have been? What should, what should Broadway have done? What responsibility, as I said, does it have to respond to these serious political matters? And then when we, when we talk about and, and take them to task, hold them to up to some kind of standard, how does the response of Broadway in the 60s differ or resemble uh, Broadway's response to World War I and World War II? Um, and so those are just some uh, uh, questions I want you to think about as we, as we continue to talk about the 60s and war, mo- uh, resistance, and Broadway. Okay, so I think that what we're going to do is I'll, I'll speak for a little while and I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the Broadway experience, but I'm going to not be on Broadway for very long. We're moving into other realms, and we'll talk about the way that the war came to Broadway, I guess, and then afterward we're gonna, we'll have questions, right, as they arise. So um, we have started talking a little bit already in this class about the rise of the of of the of the youth culture, the rise of youth cultures, and the increasing generation gap, and the um, new interest in rock and roll. And as a result of this, this has basically taken away from uh, an interest in what was con- what's considered to be, I guess, kind of like old culture, older people's culture, right? Because all of a sudden, there's this distinction between teenagers and their tastes and older people, parents, and their tastes. And it gets wider. So I think when we left it the other day, we were starting to talk about how uh, Broadway, its, its audience was getting older, right? And they, they were doing, they were tracking this, and they're noticing, like, more and more younger people are saying, no, we have no interest in this. No, and I think that that's really very reflected in what uh, Vince was showing us in terms of all of the different, like, I love that 
war is escalating. Here's Hello Dolly. You know, <laughs> wow, things are really tough. Uh, here's uh, here's uh, Mr. President, right? Mr. President, by the way, was not only uh, so it's like sort of the death of the old guard, right? I remind you that uh, um, Oscar Hammerstein dies in 1960. Richard Rogers is really sort of like this is this is kind of he he collaborates with some other people, but this is really sort of the end of his string of incredible hits. Uh, Berlin retires after after this, um, and there are a number of different composers that really sort of start to fade away, and that also leads a little bit of a gap where we have these shows that um, are serving a middle class audience and a lot of and an aging audience, and some people would argue a complacent audience. So then, where? is all the anti-war stuff. Where is the conversation about the youth culture? Where is the rock and roll? Where is the expression of what's going on right now? And the answer is uh, off, off Broadway. Now, in order to talk a little bit about off, off Broadway, I want to make sure that you all understand the distinctions between Broadway and off Broadway, right, in the first place. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Um, so. Uh, Broadway, we all understand Broadway, right? Commercial theater center in New York City, arguably of the entire United States. It's the, it's the most intense, right? There's commercial theaters in every city and every state, but really the, the concentration is not equaled anywhere else in the United States. And also size uh, has a lot to do with, um, with Broadway. So it's generally almost a thousand seats. I think the smallest one is maybe just under a thousand seats, but most of these theaters are enormous, and they are commercial, at least at this time. Um, some are now a nonprofit. That's changing. But for this time period, commercial theater center, right? That's Broadway. And then off-Broadway is smaller theaters that are less closely affiliated with one another, but they are scattered all over the city. Now, the off-Broadway movement is old. It's been around for a long time. If you think about it, Broadway gets established at Union Square, right, before there is an understanding of Broadway as we know it now, before it even gets up to, to Times Square. But what we have before that are these commercial centers, starting at the Bowery, moving up to um, Union Square, then finally landing uh, in the Times Square area. And uh, during those times, there's always these theatrical ventures that are not that are not enormously commercial, that are not gathering thousands of people to come over and watch the show every single night, right? There are comparatively less commercial entities. And for the longest time, starting at around the early 1900s and going through well until about the 1950s, this was known as the Little Theater Movement. I don't have pretty pictures, I'm sorry. It's just my chicken scratch. But anyway, so the little theater movement is this unaffiliated group of theaters that start sort of communicating with each other a little bit. And they say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm in lower Manhattan. I have no interest in, I want to do this really obscure little play that not a thousand people are going to want to come see. It would never find a nice home on Broadway. What about me? And a number of other different groups start talking to one another. And it's sort of comparatively less commercial, and it's a smaller um, a number of smaller theaters, and this kind of gathers into a movement. And starting in about the 1950s, this actually starts uh, gaining steam as a place that is a place. It's a, it's a number of different places, a number of different theaters all over the city that start to attract attention. Some of them become stronger than others, and they start to attract attention um, of critics and of uh, new audiences that are interested in moving beyond the bright lights of Broadway, right? So what we start seeing in the 1950s is that the little theater movement begins uh, getting referred to more often in the press as the off-Broadway theater, as off-Broadway theater, right? So these are houses that are smaller. They are uh, a little bit more in the way of risk-taking. Does everybody understand that? You know, if you're if you're... If you're a number one, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this in, in any kind of entertainment product, right? You discover this tiny little really interesting, wonderful band or a television show that like only two other people that you've in the world watch, right? They have no budget. And then it gets picked up. Have you seen this happen? It gets picked up. And then all of a sudden, like 
boy, this band, they've had some work done. They're suddenly so fancy. They weren't before. I kind of miss the grungy, right? Kind of miss this television show when it didn't have a trillion dollar budget and it was just kind of like fly by the sea, right? So that starts to happen with Off-Broadway. It becomes increasingly well-known. It becomes increasingly uh, respected as an alternative to Broadway. And for a lot of people, it also then becomes increasingly commercial and it's sort of lost its, 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 its lure. It's a lure, right? So there has to be a reaction to everything because that's the way the world works. And so we have the birth then of, in the late, I would say, late 1950s, early 1960s, what becomes known as off, off Broadway. And this is, it would be nice if I could spell Broadway. You'd think that I would learn how to after all these years. But anyway, so the off-off Broadway movement really begins in the late 1950s, and it's kind of focused on, it really, really gathers a great deal of steam and becomes um, hugely influential for what it is through the 1960s, and especially as the war effort increases and the youth movements increase. the off-off-Broadway movement starts really kind of unofficially with the establishment of the Café Chino. And the Café Chino, you can still go to the original space where the Café Chino is. It is, I'm not exaggerating, I think it's probably half the size of this room. Very long and skinny. There's this beautiful old tin metal roof. Um, it's on Cornelia Street. I believe now it's a Thai restaurant. And uh, if I knew the name, I'd tell you. But anyway, it's, it's, it's down there. And it was um, established by a guy named Joe Chino. And Joe Chino was this um, young man who decided, as a, he was from Buffalo, he was a, pe- a child of uh, Italian immigrants, and he decided he wanted to come to New York City and establish himself as a, as a dancer, a professional dancer. And he really worked very, very hard. But there were, first of all, it's incredibly competitive to be a professional dancer or a professional anything in New York. You really have to fight for it. Um, And he did very hard, but he also had pretty significant weight fluctuations. He struggled with his weight frequently and got tired after a while of, you know, starve himself and then he'd go for an audition and he wouldn't make the audition and then he'd be sad and then he'd eat and he'd put on weight and then he'd get depressed. And it was just this cycle and he got really tired of it. So, he decided that, and he was a beloved guy. He had lots and lots of friends and lots of artists, um, you know, lots of friends who were artists. And so he decided to pool his resources and scrape together a little bit of money and buy, again, uh, or rent, the tiniest little hole in the wall he could find and afford. He put in a coffee maker, a cappuccino maker, and he, according to the artists that he attracted, he essentially just said, come hang out and make art and do whatever it is that you need to do. Just do whatever it is that you feel like doing. And he began attracting, and this is again, this is in Greenwich Village, which is the site of the the birth in New York City of uh, sort of the counterculture movement, right? So there's a lot of countercultural activity. There's a lot of artists that are coming to New York looking for work. And while they're not working or whether they're in between jobs, they come down to the Cafe Chino, they have a cup of cappuccino, and they decide to paint on the walls and exhibit it. Or they decide to collectively write a play and put it on in the tiny corner on a table while people sit around and sip coffee and sip cappuccino and maybe bring in a glass of a bottle of wine or something and watch. And Joe Chino starts to um, encourage an increasing number of artists who become affiliated with the Cafe Chino. Um, I'm uh, thinking of Lanford Wilson. These are some of the Patrick Wilson, two Wilsons, um, Patrick and Lanford Wilson. Um, uh, Doric, there's a lot of Wilsons. Doric Wilson, <laughs> there's many Wilsons. Um, uh, and then who else, who else was, uh, Sam Shepard was the, the cre- you know, the um, experimental playwright. Sam Shepard was, was briefly involved. Uh, he was there for a while. And so there are a number of people that start coming in and writing these experimental plays. And Joe Chino uh, died in 1968, and so he had been sort of working um, at establishing this little little tiny theater place. But what started to happen by the time he died, over the course of uh, the 10 years since 1958 when he first moves into this little theater, this little tiny cafe, um, and the time that he dies in 1968, the idea of creating theater... Uh, in New York City, in alternative spaces, 
uh, in ways that are very decidedly not commercial starts to gain steam. Joe Chino is not the very first person to encourage people to make art. There are uh, uh, theater makers that have come before. There's the Living Theater, which is actually still, you can Google them and find out about the Living Theater, but there was this theater. This group was founded in the late 1940s and had been around. Um, from the Living Theater, we end up with groups like the Open Theater. There's all sorts of other, um, and then Megan Terry and various different other experimental um, theater people that start getting involved. La Mama, which um, Vince men mentioned, is an experimental theater company that still exists on East 4th Street. You can go visit it. Um, amazing place. And all of these various different theaters. And then theater companies, um, Bread and Puppet Theater Company starts cropping up. Um, the Playhouse, the Judson Poets Theater, um, the Living Theater is working in the Open Theater, La Mama. All of these are theaters, along with the Cafe Chino, that start basically putting together like a do-it-yourself attitude, like a DIY attitude, right? Well, we don't have any space. That's okay. There's an abandoned church down the street. I'm going to go. Let's go make some theater right there. Hey, we don't have any materials. All right. Well, let's see if somebody's going to make a donation and we can hang out on the street and we can make some theater on the street, right? Brandon Puppet um, made bread and made these big puppets and they did street theater and then they would do theater in whatever spaces they could occupy and afterward they would pass bread around, right? Uh, Living Theater was the theater I think I mentioned that was founded by Julian Beck and um, Judith Molina. They were a married couple, and their interest in the Living Theater was one that would uh, create theater for for socio cultural change. Right? There was this idea that if we could get theater that involved the audience, that connected in some way with the audience. And there were many different theories as to how this was done, and all of these theaters had different approaches, but basically the idea that you as an observer of theater can also be a theater practitioner, like at Cafe Chino. Oh, you're interested in making some art? Come try it. Maybe you can perform it in two hours in front of some random people having coffee. Why not? What could, what could hurt, right? So all of this starts to develop during this time. And what's kind of interesting, and I was thinking about this as Vincent is talking about the escalation of the war, is that starting with the Cafe Chino and going all the way through the early 1960s, which is when the Cafe Chino is starting to attract, is that an awful lot of this is really much more focused, at least the Chino was, focused on... Um, gender uh, the, the gender politics and identity politics, right? Joe Chino was gay, and many of the friends that he hung out with were too, and if they weren't, he made a comfortable space for people to explore. So there was a great deal of commentary on sexuality and gender. Um, the off-Broadway movement, not the off-off Broadway movement that, that starts gaining steam during this time. Young critics from places like the Village Voice start coming over and checking out this theater, these theater, this alternative ways of making theater. Um, a lot of these alternative theaters start exploring alternative types of relationships that would have been new and, and kind of unique at the time. Um, as one of the playwrights that I spoke to uh, who was involved with the Chino said, if we wanted to have people making love in our place, we had them nude because who has sex in armor, right? So as opposed to these, you know, conventions on television and on Broadway where everybody's, you know, all of these people are in a clinch and yet they're, they're fully dressed and they're like in separate beds, which was the case on television shows. And all of a sudden we have displays of nudity. We have uh, really in-depth discussion of human sexuality that's going on off, 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 off Broadway, right? In spaces that, again, could afford to make all kinds of risks and make all kinds of mistakes because what was going to happen? They passed a hat. They were performing on a table in the corner of a tiny little, um, tiny little cabaret that was really technically not even legal for them to be doing so. And police would come by and say, can't do that. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we'll never do it again. Three minutes later when the did it again, you know, but there was there was not as much in the way of um, raised stakes because this was not a multi-million dollar producer putting out millions of dollars to, to stage a show that they wanted everybody to appeal to. It was tiny little audiences that 
a couple people would come and see, and that was a success, and they went on, right? So as this grew, what's kind of interesting about it is that the, the movement starts to grow in a number of different directions. There's a real reflection of youth culture in all of the theater companies that start to spring up after the Cafe Chino. The Cafe Chino um, is really interested, again, in, in kind of uh, a, a queer theater, very broadly defined, ways of exploring uh, different kinds of sexualities, also different kinds of playwriting. Um, there were ones that followed afterward. Judson Poets Theater was founded in the basement of Judson Church, and the church uh, is a very liberal church. It still stands. It's right on the NYU campus, and um, it's, it's, they were performing shows in the church uh, gymnasium, the church basement, and the understanding with the church had this relation with the, with the, um, with the theater company, and the understanding was you can say whatever you do, you can do, you can, you can, you can be as naked or as clothed or as uh, transgressive as you want to be in your theater, and the church can never censor you, can never tell you that you have to not perform this, you can do whatever you want, and so there was this real emphasis on artistic freedom that became increasingly popular downtown. Um, and then groups like Bread and Puppet, which were much more about sort of like adapting with puppet and, and, and communing with audiences. But as this begins to develop, um, a variety of different approaches to making theater also start becoming really popular downtown, right? So again, um, the off-off-Broadway theater movement is kind of technically all over Manhattan, but really concentrated in cheap available spaces in Greenwich Village and the East Village, right? Which is why La Mama remains where it is today. But all of these different theater companies start doing things that, uh, for the first time ever, actually trickle up Right, so generally we're always talking about you know trickle down economics. The the the, the, yeah. the the really strong, the wealthy will will then influence. The right, we've seen this. It's very rare that you see, or maybe not so rare. We just don't really observe it as much. But when the time, you know, when the indie music, when somebody that records something in their basement and uploads it on YouTube, actually manages to influence an entire established commercial entity. That's kind of a different situation. And for the first time, that actually happens during the 1960s with the escalation of youth cultures, with the escalation of the civil rights movement, and especially with the escalation of the war. Because off-off Broadway starts becoming a place in which collective theater starts being viewed as a way to engage, for, first of all, for artists to get hands-on experience really working with theater that many of them hoped would bring on sociocultural change, right? If we engage deeply enough with politics, if we, you know, it's kind of like the union, the agitprop theater in the 1930s and 40s, come to think of it. But if we get together and we create something that is so transformative for our small audiences, if we are able to get them involved in ways that Broadway, with their with their very expensive tickets and their you know and their commercial sheen, is not going to do. Wouldn't it be great if we could instill some change? And so, what we start seeing over the course of the 1960s is a gradual development in interest in this kind of the, in the in this kind of interactive or, or collective theater. Right? Um, Vince's mention of the open theater. So the open theater is actually a descendant. So um, the Living Theater is this company that, again, um, I reiterate, is, is, is founded in 1948. It's Julian uh, Beck and Judith Molina, this couple, and they come up with this idea of creating theater for sociocultural change. Um, they have somebody that works with them named Joseph Chaikin. Uh, Joe Chaikin, he is sort of a disciple and he starts what's known as the open theater in the, in the mid-1960s. He starts his own theater. And that theater is devoted to collective works by a, by a, a group entity that um, will then uh, be shown to audiences and, again, with the, with the idea of, of sort of fomenting sociocultural change, of getting people involved. And so Viet Rock which was a really, uh, it, it's a strange musical because nobody's really ever heard of it. And actually, technically, it wasn't even a musical. It was, um, they, they referred to it as a, 
war movie, a folk war movie or something. I can't quite remember that it was on the it was, it's on the um, poster that we just had up, and I can't remember. I'm blanking. But anyway, um, this is 1966, and essentially what starts happening is so there's a, a director who's involved. I'm making a real mess of this board, right? But there's a director. She is involved, and she is at the head of this. Um, group of, she, she basically has a Saturday workshop. She puts out a sign and says, okay, actors, people who are interested, let's do this Saturday workshop. We're going to collectively make some theater. And so what she had the actors involved with this workshop do was bring in clippings about Vietnam and about uh, various experiences of life at home as it related to Vietnam abroad, right? So, so how are people reacting and what are you seeing in the news and how does this, and together this uh, collective put, they patched together a, a play, they built it together. So Megan Terry was kind of in charge and she, okay, yeah, no, that's pretty good. We're gonna use that, we're not. So she directed traffic, but this play really sort of came together as a group of people that were actively working together to, to, to create something, right? Now, why do I say it was not really a musical? So the music was recorded in advance. It was all written by one woman, and it's, there's no recording that exists, but it was basically Dylan, Bob Dylan-inspired, right? So folk-inspired, Bob Dylan was still in his sort of folky phase. He was moving beyond it, so it was starting to electrify, but this was basically Bob Dylan as folk artist, right? And her music is essentially... Um, woven through this piece, but through recording. So there's people enacting various different scenes that relate to the war in Vietnam and the reaction to it at home. But what we see an awful lot of, especially um, in between, is is then the occasional like 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 interstitial music or music that's being played through recording, right? So it's not really a, a musical as we understand it, but. It did feature two of the people that were in it um, were the creators of Hair, uh, Jerome Ragney and uh, James here. That's, there's no Jerry. There was Jerry. Um, so it was Jerome Ragney and James Rado, right? But and, and those are the guys that then came along and created hair. Now, I don't want to talk too much about hair because I know that a certain group of you have um, hair as a presentation coming up, and I'm going to, I don't want to steal anybody's fire. Um, but what is kind of um, unique about the connection between Off Off and, and Broadway is that suddenly, off, suddenly Broadway starts looking like the dinosaur. Suddenly, Broadway is the is the silly like here's Hello Dolly, right? And off off Broadway is the place where people are going for their real cutting edge innovation. Now, this doesn't mean that Broadway did not engage with Vietnam. There were plenty of plays that were being written about Vietnam. There were plays that started off or off off Broadway that moved to Broadway, right? The idea that we see this still happening all the time, and this really began starting at that time. It was not really typical to move something from one place and put it in a more commercial area, but at this point, this starts to become, you know, the public theater is established uh, in, in the mid-1960s. All of these off-Broadway entities or off-off-Broadway entities that then begin to exert and uh, influence on, on Broadway, right? So this starts to happen, but what we start to see during the development of the escalation of the war in Vietnam is a number of different um, th theater techniques that very slowly start to influence Broadway. Now the problem is you cannot, Broadway remains a commercial entity. So you cannot have a theater, a, a show where like people are kind of walking up and touching your face and taking off their clothes and asking you if you could maybe go outside into the street and smoke marijuana with them. That just took, that, that would still not fly very much on Broadway, especially, you know, you just paid $150 for a seat, and you're not like, no, I don't want to take off my clothes. You, you could do that, but you're, you're not so interested, right? So um, it starts to influence Broadway in interesting kind of innovative ways that, that happen very slow. And certainly when it comes to the Broadway musical, we start seeing more... Uh, distant 
and and less very very direct influences from off off Broadway to Broadway. So there are various innovations that start coming up onto Broadway before Hair gets there. Stage nudity starts, and I know that doesn't really have much to do with Vietnam, but it certainly has to do with the sexual revolution, and it certainly has to do with the youth culture, right? Because the youth culture more more comfortable sexually, more interested in, in, in sexual being, in loving one's body, all of that stuff starts happening with the, with the various youth cultures. And we start to see, starting in the fairly early 1960s, the occasional flash of somebody's, you know, backside or something, or uh, full nudity, rarely in, in plays, um, hair being the first time that, that stage nudity happens in a musical on a Broadway stage, right, the whole cast disrobes. Um, but we also start seeing innovation in the form of more um, uh, stage techniques and, and also ways of reading into theater that we're going to talk about, I think, much more in depth on Wednesday. But I, I'd like to sort of get the ball rolling a little bit here. I understand that you guys started talking a little bit about cabaret and about um, Fiddler. Right. I mean, no, you didn't. You didn't talk about cabaret or fiddler. I'm wrong. You started talking about um, about uh, um, concept musicals, yes, right? Concept musicals. concept musicals. So concept musicals um, are really, in a lot of ways, influences that that come from uh, beyond Broadway, right? The idea of a concept musical is the idea of experimenting a little bit with, with the form that you have. And so what we start seeing, and this is something that we'll take up again on um, Wednesday, though I'd like now for us to be able to have questions in a conversation. Um, uh, what we start seeing with the concept musicals is the director as auteur, like the director as the creator, as God, right? Um, very often the director, and that actually doesn't come from off, off Broadway at all, right? The idea that like that that um, Jerome Robbins or um, you know various different directors could be like a choreographer and a director and the the person that conceives the idea for the entire work, right? That's kind of what a concept musical ultimately is. But also, um, Fiddler and Cabaret are particularly interesting to me in light of. The Vietnam War, the, the, the youth movements, various different um, civil rights movement, because they are set in a faraway land in different times, right? Fiddler on the Roof is shtetl life at the turn of the century in Russia. Cabaret is, um, cabaret is, uh, is before the fall of the Weimar Republic in, in the rise of Nazi Germany, right? And my questions for you, and this is not to talk about now, this is for next time, but this is what we're going to start with. My questions for you is, how does that relate to 1960s in America? How do those two relate to the 1960s in America? Because that's what we're going to be talking about on Wednesday. For now, I'm kind of interested in um, sitting back down here, and we can, we can maybe take questions and, and elaborate on some of the stuff that we've talked about. Yes? I was just um, curious if the... Um Director as a term was uh, directly a film uh, influence. Oh. No, 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 no. Um, just oh, I'm sorry, Sh shocker. No. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, you mentioned. Direct, so I know because I know at that time that's a very. Film it's film not. Film I, 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 I don't. Um, I don't think so. I think it has more to do with the fact that a number of different composers and. Uh, that the, I think it has more to do with the fact that on Broadway at the time, the concentration had begun as a result of um, integrated musicals, right? So Rodgers and Hammerstein, they're super, super important because they've written all this music, and we must have them, and we must have their imprint on this piece, right? So the idea of an imprinted piece, like the idea of somebody that's um, creating, right? Jerome Robbins becomes increasingly important. I think that just the dominance of the, of the, of the artist... Um, uh, is is what drives that. I also think that there's also the experimental the the experimental interest in sort of taking the Broadway musical and adjusting it to a darker and more experimental time matters a lot too. So those are, but I'm not sure that it's directly related to film. How about the matters at hand? How about the subjects at hand? How about Vietnam and off Broadway and off off Broadway? Are there questions or about any of the Musicals that that. Well, ben, ben 
question does talk about the relationship between Broadway and movies, between Broadway and music, and it, it and it seems to me that the music industry is more lively, is driving uh, the culture, is in addressing these political issues in a way that that the uh, uh, Broadway is a little late. Yeah. But the same way the Broadway plays that I talked about, whether it's Camelot uh, or or uh, 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 Funny Girl, what Hello Dolly, they're they're translated to to the screen quite rapidly. And and so their influence is not just in sort of the, those you know Broadway goers, but it becomes national with albums, with movies. Uh, they they become a cultural phenomenon. So so there is an interesting dialogue between the different art forms. And there's a real split, right? I mean that happens in that certainly happens in film. That absolutely happens with music. I mean think about this. You know we've got ge- we've gone generations of everybody listening to the same stuff. Taste culture does not consider age difference. Certainly never was considered uh, for the music, for, for, for popular music. Nobody really ever got into the, oh, yeah, well, we've got to appeal to the, to, the, to the 16 to 21 demographic, and we've got to appeal. You know, that is so modern, if you think about it, right? But it was not the case back then, at, at least before the 1960s and before the dominance of the youth culture, there was really no distinction between what was marketed to older people and what was marketed to younger people. Starting in the 1960s, we start seeing, I mean, I I have this flash in my mind of like 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? Which is, uh, uh, in a lot of ways for its time, a rather experimental, strange, non-narrative film that really does... um, touch on something that that another one trying to think of what else was really popular at the time but that that like your average kind of like big money making movie in 1960 would not have no. right um, <coughs> same with music right younger people are starting to be aggressively marketed to when it comes to rock and roll right um, it's not only taken on as and adopted as young people's music, but then it, it in turn is sold back to young people as revolutionary music, as music of, of the generation, right? Mm-hmm. So that happens simultaneously. And this is really kind of a similarity where a lot of off, off-Broadway, they're listening to rock and roll. They're, you know, kind of debating whether or not they burn their draft card or, or join the draft or whether they go to Canada. You know, they... There's a lot of pressures that are going on among younger people that are just not hitting Broadway because Broadway is appealing to middle class, fairly middle of the road people at the time, right? So Broadway ends up being the entity that has to adjust, like the film industry has to adjust, like the music industry has to adjust, right? But it's usually the most commercial entity that's the one that's sort of caught unawares. Like, oh, but there's all this stuff going on downtown. Well, we don't care about that. We're, we're making really, really big, expensive theater. Well, yeah, okay, well, that's not helping you right now. Is, there, is the correlation between age and the complacency of Broadway, are they, like, directly correlating? I, I, I might say yes. I mean, my reaction would be that, yeah, I mean, who's, 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 the, who's being sent to war? Is it the middle-aged businessman and his housewife at home who's buying the tickets and you know or is it the kids that are downtown like concerned about the war and trying to figure out like there is I think that there is kind of an important distinction between you know young old uh, and and then sort of innovative versus complacent that starts to happen at this time yeah Yeah, I was going to um, ask about that because it seemed like there were so many flops in like the early 60s, or at least there was a good number of flops that, how did they balance the uh, idea of like, like how, how far can they, could they have gone in terms of like innovation to not lose the appeal of their older Yeah, there's, there's always, and that remains. That's, so I think that there's something like 80% of, like there's a ridiculous amount of, of number. I can never remember, and I, yeah, it's like something like eight, 20% of, of, of Broadway shows do like make their money back and and don't you sh- nobody nobody quote me on that because I'm pulling that I don't have notes mm-hmm. and I don't have but it's it is a vast majority of shows that do not do well on Broadway and then the ones mm-hmm. that do 
you could retire. You would never have mm -hmm. to worry. You know, I mean, the guys that are the, the, the Hamilton, they, they're, they're, they could be done if they wanted to. That's terrific. They won't be. I hope that they make many more. You know, I hope that Lynn manuel Miranda gets back to work soon. Yay. But, like, <laughs> we don't. He that that is that is a monumental success, like a, an absolutely a historic proportions, right? So the gamble is you're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose, but boy, if you win, like you really win. So it's a it's a constant pressure. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, it is within the best interest of any industry to manufacture. Uh, entertainment product that's going to do well. You want to, it's not like you want to put up flops, you want to do your best. And so you have to be very, very careful. And this is again why Off Off Broadway at the time, I mean, Off Off Broadway, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a lot of these. You know, raise your hand if you've heard of any of these. Okay, right. The, the, the diehard theater, <laughs> the diehard theater students in the classroom are super into this, and you've heard of some of these, but these are not household names, right? You might have heard of uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein, whether you know Broadway even before you registered for this class. Like, so volume matters, but you also, so you've got to, um, you've got to balance the commerce with the art on Broadway, I think in ways that are, it's a very careful cocktail. You need to be able to justify charging a hundred dollars a ticket back then it was a lot less but still it was pricey versus going in and buying a cup of coffee from somebody and throwing some change into a hat that's being passed that's an awful lot cheaper and then if you're not sufficiently entertained who cares you you bought a nice cup of coffee and you sat and you watched something interesting and you left and it cost you 50 cents right versus wait i i spent all my money i'm so mad i'm going to tell all my friends not to go see this i'm furious and it doesn't right so it's bigger stakes and it's more, and I think that um, Broadway was thus in something of a bind where, just like, I mean, commercial film, to, you know, you can't just launch something and have it be like, hey man, we're all going to sit around. They tried, after hair, they tried to bring in a lot more. Can I, can I answer? Yeah, can please. Your response, based on reading your book and others, is that, you know, to, to Matt's question, it's not, it's not so much the flops were not because they were too experimental and nobody went. The flops were because they were old fashioned, they yeah. were corny. And they were yesterday. And so I think that that's also driving change uh, in the mainstream theater world. Yeah. So I guess what I'm confused about is kind of why Broadway takes so long to get on to that, to, to the um, kind of appealing to that audience demographic. Like the music industry moved super fast between, between uh, the 50s into like the late 60s, between rock and roll uh, rising throughout the entire country. So why did Broadway take so long to, you know, after all the Hello Dollies and the the Camelots and the Man of La Manchas, like why did it take so long for hair to get there? Because, well, go ahead, were you going would to it, add? Would it be like a logistic thing because it's so easy to go into a studio and record as opposed to like getting a cast, getting a, a writing team, getting composers mm -hmm. to create all this thing? There's that. And I mean, there's out. certainly that, okay? There is there, there is that percolating uh, Broadway shows take a very, very long time. But the other thing is I want to point out that there, there was a string of flops, but all the ones you mentioned were absolutely enormous. I mean, Hello, Dolly! was one of the longest-running shows of its time. It, it was an absolutely... So nobody lose sight of the fact that just because Broadway was slowly starting to lose its younger audience doesn't mean that it necessarily felt like it absolutely had to scramble to change, right? And it tried over the course of the 1960s to attract young people, right? I, I think we mentioned rock and roll. And actually, Mr. President had a rock and roll song in it, right? The entire State Department or something burst into the twist, the twist, of course, in 1950s trend that Irving Berlin was getting to in 1962, right? So they're a little behind the times. And I think a lot of the reaction was sort of like, guys, you don't get rock and roll. You don't get the new stuff. Stick to what you're doing well. Stick to what you're doing well. Hello, Dolly's doing fine. Oh, but wait a minute. Like, we might appeal. 
Hair was an accident. I, again, hair was almost accidental. I want to leave that for those of you that are going to be yeah. leading the class on hair. But those of you that are leading the class on hair, you might want to scribble down that hair was an accident. How was hair an accident? And the other thing is that once hair did break through, it what didn't open the floodgates. It wasn't as though no. that was the beginning of, of many, many rock musicals. No, every one that came after it was terrible. It was a horrible. And then they were like, okay, well, this clearly was just a fluke. Gabrielle, did you have a question? or? Oh, um, just... Going off of like Nick's question, yes, he's there. Oh, um, that like why Broadway moved more slowly than a musical or whatever. Yeah. It could have been because of the audience and who they're trying to appeal to. That's right. And how the younger audience is moving to the um, like more progressive kind of smaller theaters or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's worth mentioning that every time they did try to bring rock and roll to the Broadway stage, or every time they did try to bring the voices of the youth movement to the Broadway stage, what would very often happen was they tried to do it in a way that was appealing to grown-ups. Um, so the first rock and roll, with the exception of like, Bye Bye Birdie was, was made fun of everybody. So Bye Bye Birdie was cute, and it was fluffy, and it made fun of grown-ups, and it made fun of kids, and it made fun of rock and roll, but it made fun of grown-ups' hatred of rock and roll. So it was like an equal opportunity making fun of everybody, and so everybody had a good time because everybody was in on the jokes. But most of the rock and roll, like Irving Berlin's trying to bring a twist to the stage, like 10 years after, or 5 years, or 7 years after the twist was even popular, like for who like what's what's that going to do right and a lot of times there were there were songs that were brought into broadway musicals that were like okay here's some rock and roll wow isn't this rock and roll stupid and boring and repetitive and loud isn't that hilarious like that's not going to attract young people that are taking this music and this time period seriously that's not going to win any favor among young people that oh great there's some rock and roll on broadway I've just been insulted, right? I mean, it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. So, it took a while. Mm. Now, <coughs> with um, Broadway, they, they, know, they, they notice off-off Broadway in its hemisphere, maybe do any campaigns towards maybe, like, pushing people away from off-off Broadway, or do they just kind of, like, see it there and we're just like, all right, that's its own thing and just left it alone? No, there was no money off-off Broadway. And I will tell you that the people that were working on Broadway, there were lots and lots of people that were working off-off Broadway, and then every time there was an audition for off-Broadway or Broadway, they would go. And if they got a job, they would... Sorry, I, I, can't do the, I can't do the show on the table in the middle of the coffee house tonight. I got a gig, right? I mean, everybody was interested in paying rent. Broadway, they, there was a, it was a, uh, it was a tense uh, relationship, but it was a beneficial relationship. It was a connected relationship, and everybody that was working off-Broadway, I mean, a lot of the off-off-Broadway denizens Sam Shepard got ended up getting produced, you know, won all sorts of awards. He's been on Broadway. Like nobody's going to say no, no. I, I, you know, the, the 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 groups that refused funding, the groups that were offered, like here's some government funding. No, down with the pigs. You suck. You can't. I'm not taking your funding. They don't exist anymore, right? They, you need money to be able to like. There was a theater genesis. They refused their. They refused their NEH grant. The, uh, have you ever heard of theater genesis? <laughs> yeah, right. So there's a mutually beneficial relationship here. Can I raise a question that, that, that sort of maybe to, to challenge something that you said and and to see what what the others think? And that that the idea that in the 1960s. It was sort of the first time the fringes were kind of influencing the mainstream. And I'm just wondering if, if, if that's substantiated by what we've been seeing with, with you know, uh, minstrel shows, you know, on the wharves and in saloons going to the theater, with the role of immigrant groups, Jews, Irish, George M. Cohan, so, sort of, I would, I would think that there might be a pattern in which these people from the margins, African Americans, are continually revitalizing and changing the product. And, and uh, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if, if uh, the 60s was more of a kind of a continuity in that sense rather than a real departure from, from the past. That's an excellent point. <laughs> dances. Where do dances come from? They don't go. Yeah. They don't come from cotillions down to the street. They go from the street up, uh, mm-hmm. and, and and other kinds of, you know, 
fashions and yeah. and, and so so I, I think I think uh, the fact that Broadway is is uh, receptive to these new generations, new ideas is part of what can does keep it uh, dynamic. Mm-hmm. Uh, now look at Hamilton. I mean, how how long has hip hop been in existence before Broadway finally gets its first? Big gigantic hit that includes some mm-hmm. some hip hop in it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's took it's only taken what twenty something years. It's so. I mean, I think so. Yeah, right. More. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I definitely think when it comes to definitely when it comes to casting and when it comes to storytelling, the the sixties were definitely influenced more about like from the bottom up, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, especially with stuff like. Uh, I'm just trying to look through the list that we have. Right, like, um, I think a funny thing happened was it was definitely not like it was. I'm trying to think of a specific example from it, but I, I always see that and like how to succeed as something as something that came from not from theater, it came from outside of theater. So you mean influence of other like television or film? Yeah, kind uh, of. Well, yeah, no, there were a lot of film right there. I mean, keep in mind not only, and I think we're out of, at, we're out of time, but do keep in mind that none of this is happening in a vacuum, right? Mm-hmm. So the questions about off off Broadway and Broadway and Broadway, still to this day, you know, you go see an off Broadway show next season. It's very very possible that the people you see in the off Broadway show, there's going to be members of that cast that are doing Broadway. Broadway people do off Broadway. It's you know there. I saw it. there's an experimental theater company downtown that's really kind of off off that has involvement with people who are established and do film and they just want to keep a hand in like small experimental and so under the radar. You know there's a lot of but it's the same with music with television. So people that are writing for television will occasionally stop and do and do and do theater. Uh, right, that's right, and that is very much the case back then too, right? I mean, there's a number of different uh, different people that are kind of dabbling. Stephen Sondheim did a television show, did a television musical, so there are, everybody knows each other. Mm-hmm. Everybody's aware. It's a small town for what everybody thinks about New York, right? Mm-hmm. Are there any other questions or issues? We're going to continue to talk about the '60s. We're going to talk. Jonesy, Jonesy, yeah. what do you got? Um, and I wonder if it's always. Broadway being influenced by lesser known plays, is there any cases of appropriation? Oh yeah. Because I know with like music, if it's like a small time producer does something interesting, a like well known producer can take it. Yeah. And the small time producer doesn't really have money, so does it happen? Yeah. Um it happens although generally speaking intellectual property. So like the director, Tom O'Horgan comes to mind as the director of um, he was a, a this famous experimental director at La Mama. Okay, which is one of the early off-off theater companies, right? And he did extremely well for himself in the off-off realm, so he got invited to direct a bunch of plays on Broadway. So it wasn't like, we're going to go downtown and we're going to watch a Tom O'Horgan piece, and then we're going to rip off Tom O'Horgan up here. It was, hey, Tom O'Horgan, can you do what you're doing there up on Broadway? The fact that after a while he wasn't able... To, to, to recreate on Broadway what he was doing off of Broadway, then he stopped showing up on Broadway, right? So, you know, if you don't make money on Broadway, then they stop inviting you to come up to Broadway. But there's a little bit more. I mean, there was, I mean, we've seen examples of theft. We've seen, you know, the Charleston. We've seen examples of African Americans that are, that are then like, but blessedly, there's, there's more in the way of rights and protections when it comes to that now, although there's still constant complaining about people that steal each other's ideas, and, you know, so it still happens. It's just, it's, I think it's a little harder, and I think during this time period, there was a little bit more of a tension off of Broadway that resulted in people getting brought up to Broadway. Yeah? Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. We Thanks, will guys. meet again Wednesday. Yeah, so we'll see you Wednesday. Yeah. So in advance on Wednesday, if you are interested in the movies, the Fiddler on the Roof movie is very long, but it's good. And I imagine some of you have seen it. Um, but we'll be looking at Fiddler on the Roof, and we will be looking at um, Cabaret. And again, those are both considered concept musicals. We can talk a little bit more about concept musicals, though I will tell you I don't love the term. But we'll, I'll tell you why. And then the other thing that we can do is talk about how do these, that's the bigger question, is how do these musicals, both of which are set 50 or 100 years prior or something like that, right, how do they reflect uh, 1960s America? <laughs>
Cool. Okay, Good. and Good. you'll get your papers back up. Mine that you got one copy. Yes, mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.